Good morning. Is that loud? Give me a second. Let me turn that down. Check, check. Is that better? Much better. All right. There we go. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. Many of you have heard it, but uh, I uh, grew up in a non-Christian home, not a bad home, just my parents weren't believers. Great parents, loved me, uh, took good care of me, um, but we never talked about Jesus. We never uh, prayed. Uh, it, it, that wasn't the kind of home I grew up in. Then in uh, fourth grade, I had a grandmother that insisted that I go to church camp. Went to church camp, experienced God for the first time at church camp in, in a life-changing way. Um, got back from church camp, and there was no follow-up. I didn't have a church to go to. My parents wouldn't take me. Um, until about seventh or eighth grade, I had a good friend of mine invited me to church, and I was hooked. From then on out, I was in church. I loved uh, the connection I had with God there. I, I knew that I was taking my relationship with him to the next level. Um, so got connected, very active throughout the rest of middle school and high school in my faith. Um, uh, very active in my youth ministry, in my church. Um, and then got towards my senior year of high school. Uh, in senior, junior and senior years, you start taking all the standardized tests to get into college, uh, the ACT and the SAT and uh, those types of uh, standardized tests. And at the same time, I was taking advanced physics and advanced biology, and I was hearing about the Big Bang Theory and evolution, and I started having questions about how that mixed with my faith and what I believed. So uh, I took my SAT and my ACT, and I, I completely aced the science sections of both of those standardized tests. And I'm not doing that to brag, I'm doing that to say that it was at that point that I went, why am I even wondering what to do with my life? I need to go into biology because clearly I have a mind for science. I loved my biology classes. That was one of my classes that I thoroughly enjoyed. And so I graduated high school, went into college and majored in biology with an emphasis in evolution. Uh, which meant that I was taking all the regular biology courses, um, but then I was placing a particular emphasis on evolutionary track. So uh, all the microbiology courses, evolution courses, things like that, I took all of those. Um, about two and a half, three years into that major, I began realizing that there were things in the evolutionary theory that didn't line up with the Bible, but also didn't line up with um, what my other classes in evolution were teaching. And let me explain. I would go into my evolutionary statistics class, which is, uh, it's the math side of evolution. Mathematics is a crucial part of all sciences. And so I would go into this evolutionary statistics class and hear um, how the numbers crunched on uh, genetic mutations, how often they took place, how often a genetic mutation was actually beneficial for a an individual or for a, a culture, a society of individuals. And realized then that I was going to my next class and hearing something completely different. In other words, the mathematics side of evolution contradicted the biological side of evolution uh, from what I was being taught. And so I started researching, I started looking deeper at what they were teaching me and I, I came to realize that um, a lot of the evolutionary theory was fairly scientifically sound, but when you got to the really hard part about science or evolution explaining where we came from, in other words, the origin of our species, that that's when it started to break down. The mathematics started to fall apart uh, when you got into that bigger picture of evolution. Um, and so I changed majors and now I'm a pastor. So um, kind of a flip-flop from where I was going. Um, let me take just a minute and um, look at some history of science. And you're like, oh, I came for evolution. No, this is important. I want you to see this. Um, there are a couple of guys. Uh, well, first off, 
This is a theory called flat earth. Um, and if any of you have ever studied science, especially uh, physics, geology, anything along that line, uh, flat earth was the theory before about 200 BC, 2 to 300 BC. They believed that the earth was completely flat um, and that the sun and the moon did one of two things. As they revolved around the world, uh, when they got to the edge of the earth, they either spun and sped to the, under, the underside of the world and then popped back up, or the sun and moon would stop and take a, a detour around the outside edge of the flat earth and then come back around. That was the reigning theory up until about 300 years before Christ. And the crazy thing about this is there were some very prominent Greek philosophers who came out and said, you know, flat earth may not be the way it is because when we go to uh, places that are far, far away, uh, you know, uh, months travel, we can't see the horizon up to a certain point. They realized that as you traveled, the horizon got closer and closer as you went along. And so they realized that maybe the earth wasn't flat, but maybe it was curved. Maybe it had a curvature to it. Um, and a lot of these very prominent Greek philosophers were harassed in their day because they started promoting this idea that the earth wasn't flat, even though the evidence pointed them to say that the earth was round or at least curved to some extent. Let's fast forward. If my, there we go. This is uh, Copernicum, or Copernicus and Galileo. Uh, these guys were the first ones to really come out and say, the earth does not, uh, does not hold the center of the universe. The theory was, for years and years and years, for centuries, is that the earth was the center of the universe and all the planets and the sun revolved around the earth. And so Galileo and Copernicus came out and said, guys, we have telescopes nowadays and we have mathematics that pretty much show us that that's not the case. We can mathematically prove that the earth actually goes around the sun, not, around, not the other way around. And so they actually were persecuted. Copernicus wrote a book about this. He was very old when he wrote it. He died uh, just a, a year or two after he wrote the book. And almost all the known copies of the book were burned by the church after he died. Then Galileo comes along. Galileo was much younger, and he said, listen, I'm with Copernicus. I agree with what he's saying. You know, here's the mathematics. Here's the evidence. Here's what I'm seeing in a telescope. Uh, here's why we believe this. And he was thrown into house arrest, all of his books were burned, um, and he was persecuted the rest of his life. His reputation was destroyed. And now, what do we know? We know for a fact that the sun is the center of our universe and that all the planets revolve around the sun, not the earth and everything revolving around it. But because of tradition that was inaccurate, these men, even though they were right, they were persecuted for their beliefs. And so here's what I want to start out with uh, this morning. Here's my question. Um, I'm going to ask you to forget everything you've been taught up until this point about what evolution is. Um, because let me say, as someone who has studied it both in a secular college and as a pastor, about 90% of the stuff that's out there about evolution is completely inaccurate as far as from churches and from religious backers. Um, it's based off of science that's 40 years old, that's inaccurate, that, that has no real uh, basis in true science today. It's based off of beliefs that they whipped up in their minds and then didn't really compare it to what the science actually said. Um, and so I want you to forget that. A, the, a great example of what I'm talking about is if you heard about or watched the Ken Ham, uh, Bill Nye debate on evolution. Ken Ham got his teeth handed to him on a platter because all of his theories, not all of them, but a vast majority of his theories were antiquated traditional theories from 30 years ago that he's still uh, you know, holding up that don't have any proof in science. And so I want you to forget and I want you to think, answer this question. If you look at God's word, because that's the measurement by which we believe, correct? God's word, we at Calvary believe that God's word is the inerrant, infallible word of God and that everything we believe is based off of that book. So if that's the case, what does the Bible say is the absolute, no holds barred, you can't waver whatsoever, it's non-debatable thing when it comes to biology and evolution? Does it say that evolution cannot exist? Does it say anywhere in the Bible that God did not 
create us to change and adapt a little bit to our environment? Is there anything in God's word that says that? No. The only thing that is completely non-negotiable when it comes to God's word is that we were created, everything was created out of nothing using God and his word and that we were created in his image, correct? Those are the only things that the Bible says, these are the only things that are not debatable. We were created by God, his hand, his words made us out of nothing And we were actually made, we were special, we were different than the animals and the plants and and all the fish and all the other living things on the earth. We were different because God sat and molded us with his hands out of the dirt and breathed life into us and made us in his own image, right? That is the one thing. Those are the the places where the Bible says this is a non-negotiable. And so let's start with that place. Because if we start with what God's word actually says, again, I'm throwing a lot of the tradition out the window. Um, I'm saying that we need to hold on to God's word, not on to traditions that are not based on God's word. So if we hold on to God's word, we know that we are created in the image of God by him. So what does that mean? It means that there's a possibility that evolution could exist. There's a possibility that evolution is part of God's creation, that he put evolution into the way he made all living things so that as living things traveled around the earth or as the earth's environments changed, those living things could change with it. Let's think about Calvary's core values. What is the fourth Calvary core value? Change. We can't follow God without changing. And guys, that's biological also. Look at the earth. The earth is in a continual state of change. Physically, geographically, it's continually changing. We've got a movie coming out called San Andreas that talks about, it talks about the San Andreas Fault and the end of California is gonna drop off into the ocean. The earth is always changing. (laughs) We're gonna have oceanside property, ladies and gentlemen. But everything is constantly in change. And so if we truly believe that, doesn't evolution have a place in God's creation? Let me show you why I believe this. And I hope none of you have closed your ears to me yet. Because I'm going to give you both the biblical and the scientific reason why I believe this. So the Bible states that we have to believe that we were created in his image. And evolution, so let me define evolution for you real quick so that everybody understands we're on the same page. Evolution technically is the change in a gene pool. In other words, our genetic code. Stick with me if you're not into science very much. It's a change in the gene pool of a population from generation to generation. So it's a change in the genetic code that takes place over many generations by such processes as Mutation, which is where uh, on the DNA strand, one of when it copies it and splits the cell or copies it to go give an instruction to the cell to do something, it miscopies. It makes a, an inaccurate copy. So it goes A, D, D, T, T, and it misses, and instead of a T, it puts an A accidentally. And it, that's a mutation. It's a change in the genetic code. Uh, it's either the process of mutation, natural selection, Natural selection is simply where animals or plants, living beings, um, the strongest live and the weakest die off, and the characteristics of that stronger one are what is genetically carried on, right? So if a zebra, um, has, if a male zebra is particularly fast and strong, probably his genetic code is going to be passed on through natural selection because he's going to survive better where a weaker male who is slow or limp or has a deformity, he's going to be picked off and his genetic code is not going to be passed on. That's natural selection. And uh, then genetic drift. Genetic drift is a combination of some of all this, and I could get into that. It's very technical, but uh, I'm not going to go into that area. So, So let me say right now, we can confidently say without a doubt that evolution takes place today. We have scientifically witnessed, I'm not talking about we manipulated science and we tweaked some numbers here and there to make it happen. No, we have observed in science, in nature, 
evolution taking place. It happens amongst virus, viruses and bacterium on a very rapid scale. Uh, we have a doctor here who could attest that one of the difficulties with treating uh, disease is that the disease continually mutates so quickly that it's hard to keep up with sometimes, depending on uh, what disease it is. It's hard to keep up with that uh, change that those viruses and bacterium uh, are going through. You'll give a person a drug, and because of a genetic mutation, you know, two weeks down the road, suddenly that drug no longer works because the, the bacterium or the virus has actually mutated and has evolved to survive in that medical scenario where that drug is in that person's body. So we see it on a viral and bacterial scale almost all the time. I mean, hospitals are fighting this issue constantly. We have, we have introduced so many antibiotics into the world today that we have strains of bacterium that are almost completely immune to the, uh, the medicines that we can give them. That's a process of evolution. Those viruses and bacterium were either non-existent or so rare that you never saw them uh, 60 years ago because they evolved so quickly. But let me give you something that is very simple and easy to understand that we have witnessed in the last 200 years. This is the pepper tree moth. It's very prominent in England. You find it all over the place in England. Um, and Several, a couple hundred years ago, when the Industrial Revolution took place, the white one that's on the right hand side um, was very prominent. You saw it all over uh, England. And it was because the trees uh, in England, because of the, the environment and the cold weather and the, the moist environment, lichens grew on the trees. It's a type of um, I think it's a fungus that grows on trees and it's light colored. It's like a whitish gray color. And so because of their color blend, they blended perfectly in with these lichens. And so pig, uh, birds and uh, different animals couldn't see them to pick them off and eat them. So they were very prominent. Then industrial revolution takes place and the lichens all on the trees either died off because of the excessive soot and carbon monoxide or they were covered with soot. So they turned a dark gray or black color. Suddenly, the scientific and natural societies noticed in England that the white moths were hard to find. No one could find them anymore. But these dark colored moths were suddenly very prominent and you could find them all over the place. And so they took some of these, both types of these moths and we put, they put them together and realized they could interbreed, which means they were the same species. They could interbreed with one another, produce an offspring, and that offspring could then interbreed and, and produce offspring as well. That's the definition of a species, and, and two animals that can breed with one another and produce viable, uh, fertile offspring. So... They experimented with these peppered moths and found out that they were the exact same species. They were just a slight genetic difference in the two. And because of mutation and natural selection, one moth became prominent over another one because of the change in their environment. Guys, that's evolution. It's very simple. We, we, we as a church have made evolution into this very magical thing. It, it's very simple. It's it's a process that God designed in our bodies and in nature altogether to make us to where we could adapt to our changing environments because the world is always changing. If God didn't make us able to change, almost every species on the face of the earth would die off at some point because their environment would change, they could not adapt and change with it, and they would die as a result. Guys, you have no idea, if you've never studied biology, Every creature on the face of the earth can only live in a very tight spectrum of environmental conditions. There are a few exceptions, uh, but most, the vast majority of living things on the face of the earth can only live in an environment that's within a few degrees. And it can only live in certain environments with certain amounts of moisture. And, and each of these species have adapted to those specific environmental conditions. And when they change, a mutation has to take place because if it doesn't, They'll die off. So I hope this kind of opens your mind because there's a difference. Let me make a very clear distinction here. There's a difference between evolution, what I'm talking about here. There's a difference between evolution and there's a difference between evolution to the origin of species, which means evolution explaining where we came from. That part is unbiblical. Evolution explaining where we came from is not the way God 
tells us it happened in the Bible. But evolution, kind of making these small changes throughout time in an environment, that's very natural. We see it all of the time. It's things that we've observed day in and day out. So, evolution exists, but I want to take our focus off of that and start talking about um, the proof that evolution to the origin of species does not exist. In other words, that evolution cannot explain where we came from. So Darwin, in his book, Origin of the Species, had this impossible test. It's toward the end. It's in the last chapter of his book, uh, Origin of Species. Um, It says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could possibly not have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications. Okay, so let me explain that. Let me put that in layman's terms. If any organ or organism, in other words, any organ in a, in a body or organism that's on the face of the earth, existed and it could not have come about through some kind of very slow adaptation, natural selection, genetic mutation over a long period of time, if it could be shown that some organism existed on the earth that could not have come about through that process, he says this, my theory would absolutely break down. But then he adds, but I can find no such case. And that's Charles Darwin. Um, Charles Darwin, of course, if you know anything about evolution, he's the father of evolution. Evolution theory was already around, but Darwin's the guy who really solidified it. He's the guy who went out and found the proof of evolution and showed scientifically that evolution exists. He's the guy that went to the Galapagos Islands and, and showed the finches and the, uh, the lizards that lived there Uh, the iguanas, and how they had adapted to each different island along that chain. So he's the father, but what he says is, listen, if it could be shown that any organ or organism could not have come about through evolution, my theory falls apart. Because he's explaining, he's fighting, saying that evolution tells us where we came from. So the impossible test can be shown. In other words, his test can be demonstrated. Let me give you how it can. Um, it's called, well, if my remote will reach, it's not going to reach. Of course it's not. It's called irreducible complex, uh, complexity. Irreducible complexity. Let's see if I can get it to... You have to know how to work ProPresenter. It's on the laptop that's actually on the wall right there, Steph in front of you, because it won't reach. (laughs) So irreducible complexity. This is basically um, the idea that there are organisms on the earth that could not have existed uh, through evolutionary, uh, the evolutionary process. And I'm gonna give you several examples, but the one I really wanna focus on is the simple cell. Uh, Stephanie, hit the next button for me. Oh. Go back, sorry, I didn't put that one in. Um, Every cell has what's called a cytoskeleton. A cytoskeleton is basically the structure that gives its cell its shape. Um, It keeps it uh, from being torn apart because it it has no support structure inside of it. It gives it its strength and its shape. So uh, a cytoskeleton is in there. The cytoskeleton, if you took a picture, you can actually Google cytoskeleton. Harvard has gone in with micro, uh, uh, microscopes and have dyed the cytoskeletons in human cells. And they're so complex, it looks like New York City. It looks like you're looking down at a map of New York City because of the complexity of all these microtubules that are running throughout the cell. Not only that, there's also... Um, numerous organs inside every simple cell. Uh, Every cell, no matter how simple it is, has to have a nucleus. It has to, because the nucleus contains the DNA, which is the instruction manual for that cell. Without the DNA, the cell cannot exist. Even viruses, which are, there are scientists that debate whether viruses are really living things or not, which is total hogwash, because they are. But even there are some forms of viruses that don't have DNA, but they at least have RNA. They have a genetic code. They have some kind of complex instruction manual on how to run that simple cell. Because without the instructions, it's not living. Because it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't do any processes. And so there's a cytoskeleton. There's all these organs. And so, all right, Steph, hit the next one now. I'm going to show you a video of the inside 
of a very simple cell. I mean, this is the basic, uh, simplest, simple cell. This is a video off of YouTube uh, called Unlocking the Mystery of Life. There's 12 chapters in it. Uh, it's actually uh, was made by a group of uh, creationists or intelligent design theorists. Um, this is a simple cell, the simplest of single simple cells. And what it's about to show us in this uh, graphic is the process by which it undoes the DNA inside of a nucleus, reads the DNA to do some function within the cell, and then sends that DNA signal out. And so this is the nucleus. Um, what you're seeing here is a um, nuclear pore complex. And we'll come back to that in a second. There's the DNA strand. You've probably seen this. It's very common. Each one of, the, uh, of all of these dots are different amino acids. The amino acids work like a computer program. It's a series of zero, one, two, three, four that gives the cell the instructions. Now, this is a, uh, a messenger RNA producer. It comes along, it unties. Some of them untie the DNA and some of them just attach and revolve around it. But it's a, a complex organ that comes in and then replicates the code. In other words, it's writing down in a physical sense what the code is on that DNA. So it replicates the DNA. Now that strand, that copy is called RNA, messenger RNA specifically, because it's sending out a message to the rest of the cell. It goes to the nuclear pore complex. Now this pore complex is so complex that it only lets certain things in and out. It's coded. So it lets the RNA out because the RNA has been read and it's been okayed to been, be released out of the nucleus. And it goes out through a series of uh, microtubules to another organ within the cell. Um, this is a two-part machine called a ribosome. And the ribosome is what is the next reader. It's the organ that actually comes in and says, okay, this is an A, so we need to put this amino acid here. And this is a T, so this amino acid goes here. And it does that over and over until it ends up with a series of these amino acids. Proteins are made up of a series of amino acids. So every function in a cell has to go through this process. This is constantly happening in every single cell on the face of the earth. And so it's making these and then sending out the RNA and the uh, complex amino acids right here. Those are amino acids. They're linked together at this point, but they're not a protein yet because proteins aren't a string. They're actually a complex folding of a string of amino acids. So now it goes back in uh, to another cell uh, and it, uh, or another organ and it gets folded into the specific design that that protein needs to have in order to function correctly within the cell to do its job. So it gets folded up inside of this cell. And so it's folded, it's turned, it's twisted, it's folded, it's overlapped, it's, it's made. And then it gets sent out of this into the cell. But the crazy thing is, is that there are these other organs like this that have to send it to where it's going to be used. Because without it being sent to the specific area that it's going to be used, it's totally useless. All right, Steph, go ahead and fast. We don't have to listen to this guy. He's boring. Um, <laughs> Got to liven it up a little bit because I know I'm boring right now. But the issue here is that We've got a very complex process happening, and this is a base process. In other words, every single cell has to go through this type of process on a constant basis. But look how complex that is. I mean, if you were to look even deeper, Harvard has gone in and created some animations. You can go in and uh, uh, YouTube it uh, under cytoskeleton microtubules. Uh, Harvard videos pop up where they have... Uh, made uh, computer generated graphics of these things being transported throughout the cell and different processes taking place and just how complex it is and how many separate complex organs exist inside the cell to make sure that it operates. So let me give you a hypothetical here. Let's say something happens to the cell and the outside of the cell wall gets damaged. The cell has to repair it, correct? That process right there had to have taken place in order for the repair of that cell wall to, t to happen. So basically, something happens on the cell wall, there's an organ that detects the breakage. 
goes down to and sends a message to the nucleus. The nucleus receives the message, unwinds the DNA or reads the DNA, makes a long strand of RNA. The RNA goes out. The RNA does not just float randomly through the cell. It's actually carried along microtubules by another organism. The Harvard video shows the microorganism organ inside the cell. It's almost like a foot a set of feet that walk along the microtubules. There's those and there's also microtubules that are literally tubes that the RNAs can go through like a tube to different organs. So the RNA leaves the nucleus, is carried by another complex organ to another ribosome. The ribosome uh, decodes the RNA and turns it into a series of amino acids. It's then picked up by another organ that's taken over to another uh, organ to be then folded and made into the exact type of protein that's needed. Then once it's folded, it's turned into a protein. There is a messenger, a organ that literally picks that protein up and knows exactly where on the cell wall to take it. How complex is that? Evolution would say that single cell that we just saw, the simplest single cell came about through a random mashing of proteins and amino acids, okay? That's what evolution teaches. Evolution to the origin of species. There are five prominent theories out there about how this could take place. The one that a lot of people are really holding a lot of weight on right now is that either in a steam vent on the bottom of the ocean or within a protein-rich environment that was circulating that had lots of proteins and amino acids that because of the circulation over billions of years, suddenly all of them just came together and there's your single cell. That's what evolution teaches us where we came from, that the origins happened. So let me tell you what the problem with this theory is. Um, say I had a box of Legos, okay? And those Legos made something very specific. Let's say I went to Walmart and I bought the Lego set that makes the Death Star, the $250 Lego set that's got like 2,000 Legos in it, okay? That's nowhere close to the complexity of a single cell. It's actually estimated that the simplest single cell has over 10 million proteins in it, 10 million building blocks. So imagine a Lego uh, construction piece that had 10 million Legos. That's what I'm talking about here. So 10 million Legos. And I take those 10 million Legos and I dump them into a pool that's circulating water or it's constantly in motion. You with me so far? 10 million Legos that make this massive cell. But not only that, I throw in 20 other sets of 10 million Legos and throw them in there also. You with me? Some of them with similar pieces, some of them with pieces that don't go to the one that I actually wanna create. And these millions upon millions of Legos are floating and swirling in this pool. So take a swimming pool, for example. Floating in our swimming pool and they're churning and they're moving. Science, evolution to the origin of species would say that over time, eventually, those 10 million pieces from the one that you want to create suddenly come together and make the Death Star, Star Wars, massive um, Lego piece. But here's the problem with this. So these are the seven hurdles that would have to be jumped over in order for this to take place. The first one is availability. So first off, we're saying that all of the pieces that we need are there. In other words, if I opened the box for that Lego Death Star and I dumped them in and didn't even realize it, but one of the pieces were missing, it couldn't happen. Every single one of the 10 million pieces would have to be available. They'd have to be present. One of them missing would not create a single cell that would actually work because even one protein could mess it up. So first off, the proteins have to be available. Every Lego piece has to be there. The second one is synchronization. They all have to be available at the exact same time. In other words, one of the pieces, um, I couldn't dump the box in and walk away and two days later realize, oh, there's a piece still in the box that's stuck to the glue on the bottom or something because that wouldn't work either. Not only do they have to be available, they have to be available at the same time. That's important because time is a big deal here. Then they have to, you have to have localization. In other words, all 10 million of those pieces have to be available at the same time in the same place. If one of those pieces is floating off at the shallow end of the pool while all the other ones are in the deep end, it's not gonna work. 
because they're not in the same place. Then you have to have no interfering cross reactions. Remember the other Lego boxes that I dumped in? If any of those other pieces are in the same area at the same time as those 10 million that I wanna make the Death Star out of, it won't work. Because if you know how a single cell works, if one thing enters into a single cell that doesn't belong, the single cell starts working to shove it out, to get rid of it, because it doesn't belong there. It's not supposed to work that way. So our bodies do the same thing. We take in something or something pokes our skin, our body works to absorb it or push it out. Then, there, so there can't be any junk, in other words. There can't be any junk proteins or particles or anything like that in the way during this time in this area. Then, here's where it gets a little more complex. There has to be interface compatibility. In other words, all the Legos have to be facing the right direction. If, I've got, if I try to build the Death Star and I've got all these 10 million pieces together and one of them slipped upside down, is that gonna work? No, not only is it not gonna work, it's gonna throw off the whole thing. If you know anything about Legos, they work a specific way and when you flip them over, it actually doubles how wide they are and it throws off the whole thing, it can't work at all. Proteins work the same, same way. They're very complex in their structure and in the way that they interlock with one another. So they have to all be facing the other way. In other words, think of it, uh, if Legos are a hard way to think of it, think of it like a nut and bolt. Have you ever tried to put a nut and bolt together and had them womper jaw like they're not lined up right? Is that ever gonna work? Never in a million years, no matter how many times you turn that bolt to go in that nut, it's never gonna go in there. You have to have it lined up perfectly in line, don't you? It has to be perfectly level with the other piece in order for it to screw together. Same thing here, proteins have to be, they are very intricate, very detailed, and they have to fit together a very, very specific way in order to work. Then there has to be the proper order assembly, right? Think the Death Star Lego piece. If the piece that goes here is actually over here, is that gonna work? No. Even if the piece that goes here is right here, is that gonna work? No, have you ever tried to put a Lego together and you're a millimeter off? It doesn't work. Same way with proteins. They are so exact and they link together so tightly that if they're off by even a, a fraction, then they won't work. They won't link in and fit together. So they have to have order assembly. And then lastly, they have to be in the right configuration. They have to be turned, flipped. All this uh, complexity has to be exactly correct. Now, a lot of that sounds the same, but it's actually a slight modification difference of all of them. All seven of these hurdles would have to take place for one single cell to come together randomly. And that's what science says is happening. That's why I say the mathematics of evolution don't add up when we're talking about the origin of species. Because statistically speaking, to hurdle all seven of these and create a single simple cell is impossible. It, mathematically, it could not happen. There's another that you could tie in uh, to the configuration, the last hurdle that you'd have to jump. There would have to be some kind of force also because unlike molecules that are attracted to each other because of a magnetic attraction, um, some proteins attract to one another, but others do not. Some, you have to actually click them into place and click them together. That's why RNA and that whole process is so important. If, it, if they attract it, if every protein just attracted and fit together perfectly, then half the process that we saw in that video would not have to take place. So you actually have to force, you would have to have a force that pushed some of these uh, proteins together, just like a Lego. You can't just set two Legos on top of each other and they go together. You have to push them together, right? So all of these things would have to happen in order for the first simplest single cell to come into creation. And that's where we have a problem. That's where we say Darwin's theory of the origin of species does not hold water because this is impossible. There's no way that something as complex and as intricate and as detailed as a cell could just randomly come together and work. It's, I heard an a evolutionary theorist say one time, um, it's like saying that you could bomb every newspaper factory in the world and that eventually one of those factories, after the rubble settles, you're gonna have a perfect dictionary sitting there. 
That's, that's what it's like. That's the, that's the statistical likelihood of a simple single cell happening. Even if you bomb, the, bomb factory after factory after factory for billions of years, you're never gonna end up with a dictionary. It's just not physically possible. It's not mathematically possible. There's no way that could happen. But that's what evolution to the origin of species says happened to us. So, um, what we have here is a situation where Darwin's impossible test has been shown. His impossible test saying that his theory of the, our origins would fall apart, this is the test that defuncts his theory of our origins. And there is a group of uh, intelligent designers. Uh, FYI, in the science community, nobody says creationism anymore because it's gotten such a bad stigma on it. Uh, everybody uses the term intelligent design saying that there's some intelligence out there that designed the world. Uh, and part of the advantage of using that term is in the scientific community is if a scientist who is not a believer but sees the intelligence behind this wanted to study it, he could study it even though he wasn't a Christian. So everybody uses the term intelligent design, but there are several large scientific organizations in our country now that are doing these types of theories. They're found in a few seminaries. They get their funding through them, uh, through Christian universities, things like that. Um, and they have organizations where they come together and they, they do the research and they do the mathematics and they do the studies and all the things that they need to do to show that intelligent design created, that a God, something more powerful than us, created the, the beings on this earth. Um, so we have this ir irreducible complexity. Um, now, I know some of you just got finished with that 20 minutes and went, I'm so confused. <laughs> you lost me at irreducible complexity. So let me give you some much simpler examples. Stephanie, hit the next slide, please. Giraffes. Giraffes are amazing creatures. John, uh, Knox, Jana, and I were at the zoo uh, two or three weeks ago, and they had uh, four giraffes there, and they were just so fascinating uh, to watch and to look at. One of the things that our tour guide, as we're going by the giraffe thing, said is that uh, special, uh, giraffes are very specialized. Their long necks help them reach uh, the food on the trees that no other animals can really reach. And so that's why they thrive is because they have one food source that none of the other animals have access to. Um, they have tongues that are specialized to reach into a tree, wrap around a leaf and set of leaves and yank them off and start chewing them. Um, they chew their cud like cows do. Uh, there's a whole species, uh, 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 not species, uh, a whole genus of animals that chew their cud like cows. Giraffes falls into that genus. So uh, they're very specialized, but our tour guide said um, giraffes don't bend down to drink water very often. Um, they actually get a lot of the moisture that they need to live out of the leaves that they eat, but they every couple of days do need to supplement those leaves with a drink of water. You see the giraffe in the second picture. Very awkward for a giraffe to take a drink, correct? Now a giraffe weighs you know, hundreds, of, hundreds of pounds. They're three to four times heavier than we are uh, just in their body region, not including their neck. So imagine, have you ever bent down super quick and then whipped back up, done this thing right here? <laughs> what happens? All the blood just rushed to my head for a moment and I was, woo. Now imagine if you were a creature that was five times heavier than I am and you did that and the blood rushed to your head. All this blood, you know, I'm talking a few pints of blood, maybe tops, not even that, rushing to my head, no big deal. It just makes me a little dizzy because it actually shocked the brain slightly. But a giraffe has hundreds of pints rushing all of a sudden down its neck. A giraffe has seven valves along its neck, along its main arteries that run to the brain. And these seven valves, as the neck begins to go vertic or goes horizontal and then back down, those valves began to fluctuate. They pump. In other words, they slow the blood down as it runs down the neck. So it's, it slows the blood down, and then there is a blood membrane at, right at the base of the skull of all giraffes, and it's, very, it's a common membrane. It's actually found in almost all uh, warm-blooded animals. Uh, but this membrane on the base of the skull at this particular place is only found in giraffes. And what this membrane does 
is it, it branches. It's, it's where the blood vessel is very large and then all of a sudden it just branches into thousands of tiny, uh, uh, much, much smaller blood vessels. And what that does is, have you ever had water go through a pipe and then go through a smaller pipe? What happens? It slows down because then there's friction, there's force that's preventing it from continuing the speed that it's gone down. Plus, it reduces the amount of water at that place. What these vessels do is they constrict, they contract, and then they open up to allow the blood to come in at the right level and speed and volume to keep the brain from being just pulverized by this massive force coming through the neck. So amazing adaptation. But I would actually say that this is not an adaptation. I would say that God created the giraffe this way, and here, let me tell you why. Mutations in large animals with a very complex organ cell system have about, and the estimates are all over the charts uh, because there's not a real scientific number here, but most estimates say that within an entire generation, a, a large animal has somewhere around 200 to 500 mutations that take place every generation. In other words, within a population. And so for a giraffe, walk with me here, as the giraffe's neck over time elongated, if we, if we hold that this happened through evolution, I, I'm hypothetical here, if let's say this happened through evolution, the neck gets longer, then what's gonna happen the first time a, 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 an individual is born with a rather large neck? The first time it bends down, what's gonna happen? It's, it's either gonna die or it's at least gonna be minor, have minor brain damage because as many as these mutations happen in a generation, only one beneficial mutation happens every 100 to 500 years, according to estimates. Again, this is, these are estimates, according to what science has uh, kind of deduced. So let's say one positive mutation takes place and the neck elongates and they can reach food that no other animals can reach, that's great. But unless it has the other two mutations for the valves and the uh, vein membrane, it still wouldn't work, would it? Because elongating the neck is not enough. Elongating the neck only creates more complex problems that have to be solved through, according to evolution through mutation. And so take the reverse. Let's say a short-necked animal developed the valves in the neck. How would that be beneficial to them? It wouldn't. And the evolutionary theory says that if it's not at least minorly uh, beneficial, if it doesn't help the individual, then it's likely not gonna be carried on or at least spread enough to become a, po a part of an entire population. And so say a, a creature uh, before the giraffe, again, going hypothetically according to evolution, let's say one was born with the valves in its neck. It had that mutation to create those valves. How would that be beneficial to the individual? It wouldn't have. And more than likely, it would not have been passed on to the next generation because it wouldn't have been a positive beneficial mutation. But let's say it did. Let's say for some crazy reason, it was passed down and it spread amongst the population for some crazy reason. As the neck elongated, the valves are not enough. So another mutation would have had to take place for the membrane to happen, the vein membrane. While mathematically, if you gave it billions of years, this could possibly happen, but most evolutionists believe that a, the giraffe is so specialized that it's actually a very recent evolutionary jump. In other words, giraffes haven't been around for the billions of years that we think. It, ev uh, according to evolutionary theory, giraffes are pretty recent creatures. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have found no relative that's even close to the giraffe in structure in any of the fossil record. And so there's, we don't have any record of an in-between stage between, uh, you know, it was this, and then it was this, and then it was this, and then it became a giraffe. We don't have that fossil record. So that's problematic. So the neck on a giraffe is so complex that it mathematically is very unlikely that it could have happened through evolution. Steph, hit the next one. Everybody loves a zebra, right? Everybody loves a zebra. Zebras are another uh, animal that is very specialized. Um, they have actually uh, very recently discovered that zebras have started co-herding with other species. In other words, they will co-herd with a group of oxen. 
uh, on the African safari because they've, through their intelligence, have discovered that if you enlarge the size of a herd, it increases the level of protection. But let me ask you this. You take a herd of zebra, like this picture right here, a small herd. What's the practical application for the stripes? What makes the stripes beneficial for this individual or group? It's camouflage. As a cheetah or a lion or some predator approaches the herd, the zebra does what? It takes off. The entire herd starts moving. And because of these complex stripe systems on their bodies, as they begin to run to a predator who is also running, all of the zebras kind of blend into one another and they just look like one mass. So the predator then cannot pick out one individual out of the group. So there comes a point when the predator is running and running and running and it can't find an individual that it gives up because it runs out of energy and the zebras continue on and they're safe. That's the advantage to the stripes with a zebra. But there's a big problem here if this is evolution because let me ask you something. Let's say all of these, you know, we'll call them horses because they, that's the closest thing that we can relate to uh, as Americans. Let's say a group of horses that were whitish in color were living in a large herd. And all of a sudden, a baby's born and it's got these stripes. If he's up against a herd of solid colored animals and they take off running from a predator, is that going to help him blend in or is it going to make him stick out? It's going to make him stick out. This happening as an individual or even a small group mutation would have not been beneficial. It would have been detrimental to the individual, meaning that as that herd took off to escape from the predator, the predator could easily pick out the one striped one, pick it off, and that line, that mutation is done. It's finished. So we have a hard time explaining how the zebra got its stripes because mathematically and according to evolutionary statistics and theory, it's not really very likely that this could have happened. As a matter of fact, it's very closer to impossible because of the way evolution works. Um, let me give you two more um, giant leaps in our uh, process of evolution, if, if you believe in origin of the species, that are problematic uh, for Darwin's theory. How do almost every single cell on the face of the earth, how do they reproduce, sexually or asexually? Asexually, which means they do not exchange genetic code with anyone, they just split. They duplicate their DNA, split, and you end up with two exact copies of the original cell, correct? That's asexual reproduction. That's how every simple single cell reproduces on the face of the earth. Simple cells do not exchange genetic code. So let's say billions of years pass and you get a single cell that grows complex and becomes a multi-cell creature. That's actually an evolutionary leap that can be explained fairly easily. Uh, so let's say that happens through the evolutionary process and instead of a single simple cell, we've got a complex creature that's made up of many single cells. And those single cells become one creature rather than a grouping of a bunch of single cells. And some of those cells inside of this creature begin to become specialized. It grows, uh, you know, the very simplest of, ace, of sexual reproductive creatures has light spots, not actual eyes. They're the, kind of the evolutionary beginning point of an eye. They detect light, but they can't actually see. Um, jellyfish, for instance, can detect what is above and what's below because of, of light. They have light sensors. Um, so let's say this complex creature develops things like this and it grows complex enough that it's kind of functioning at a higher level than a single cell. How could that complex creature then make the jump from asexual, where it's just dividing itself and making clones, to sexual reproduction, where it's coming up to another individual and exchanging in some way genetic code with it? Let me give you some hurdles here. What kind of things would have to take place? First off, you'd have to have the genetic mutation that is specifically designed to extract genetic code, and not just genetic code, but exactly half of the genetic code, and then get it out of the body. So you have to have one 
uh, genetic mutation that would create that, that process. Then you'd have to have another genetic mutation that would have to take place that would create some kind of mechanism that would extract the DNA out of its body or would at least accept DNA from another individual because you can't exchange DNA without some kind of physical transfer. Uh, most very, very simple creatures extract all their DNA and they dump them on top of each other and the, the, the eggs and the sperm uh, fertilize each other outside of their bodies, uh, unlike our bodies. So there has to be some kind of mechanism, some kind of organ that would extract that half of that DNA out so that it could share DNA with another individual. Then another individual at the exact same time in the exact same place would have the exact same genetic mutations. The likelihood of even these few little genetic mutations happening are so small. The likelihood is so unlikely that evolutionists still have not figured out a way that that could have happened. So we've got these leaps in the evolutionary process, if we believe that the origin of our species can be explained through evolution, there are these leaps that had to have taken place that no one can explain. The last one is a difficult one. It's very common. Uh, students, if you're in high school or college, you read these in your textbooks all the time about evolution. It's the leap from where animals lived in the water to where they suddenly started living on land. And that's a crucial one. This is one that's pivotal in the evolutionary story of this world. How could an animal who is genetically designed to live in the water suddenly create some kind of mutation to be able to live on the land? The problems with this are, first off, you have to have the genetic mutations. And we're not talking one, we're talking multiple mutations. Because you would have to go from having gills to having lungs. Do you know how, many, how much genetic code is devoted just to the lung system? It's ridiculous. You'd have to have hundreds of mutations taking place all at once. Evolutionary theorists believe that there's a possibility that you could have a chain reaction mutation where a set of genes mutate all at the same time because it start, you know, one started and it created a chain reaction down uh, the chromosome. Um, I don't think that holds a lot of water because we have not ever seen it in uh, our own genetic code or in the genetic code of any animals or plants that we have analyzed. Uh, it's very, very, very unlikely. But that's how they theorized that the lungs would have had to have developed, is this uh, cascade of genetic mutations happening all at the exact same time. So you'd have to have lungs instead of gills or a combination of the two, a modification of the gills that could breathe air instead of water. It's a possibility, but it's not likely, again. The second thing that you'd have to have is you would have to have a genetic mutation that, instinct, that created an instinct to get out of the water. Does that make sense? We, a lot of our instinct is genetically written into our code. For example, when a baby's born, do you have to teach a baby how to breathe? Does it breathe through its lungs in the womb? To an extent, it, it pulls in the amniotic fluid and pushes it out, but it's not, it doesn't know that it's needing to do that. Let me give you another example, because that one's actually one that could be explained. But what about feeding? Does a baby just instinctively know how to eat when it's born? Or do you have to sit down with a child, with an infant, and go, okay, now here's how you hold your lips, and you gotta do this sucking thing, so here's a straw, why don't you practice on this? No, a baby is born and a baby knows exactly how to feed because it's written into its genetic code. It's an instinctual reaction that happens in when, you're, when a baby is being developed in the womb, the genetic code is actually encoding on the brain how to eat. There are certain bodily functions that our body has to know how to do without having to be taught that are crucial for life. So, you would, if you had an animal that was living in the water, developed lungs or whatever, you'd also have to have a genetic code that brought that animal a desire to come out on land. Because do fish want to come out of the water? No, they don't. That's ridiculous. 
So the idea that genetic code would have to be developed, there's too much genetic code happening all at once for this process of a water animal coming out onto the land and breathing dry air. There's too much genetic mutation taking place all at one time for that to really be possible. Even over a series of generations, we're talking millions of genetic modifications, and that's just not very likely. So there are some of these leaps in the evolutionary theory that don't really hold a lot of water. Um, so let me do this. Um, go ahead and hit the next slide. Um, let me give a word of warning, especially to our young adults and uh, high school, middle school students. Guys, uh, some of you may disagree with me on this point, but please hear me out on this. Um, do not use this information as a fighting tool against your teacher, um, because believe me, I've gone through evolutionary classes in college, and I went to college in a university in Texas, in the Bible Belt. And so people challenging their biology teacher on evolution happened on a regular basis. I saw dozens upon dozens of them and never saw somebody beat their professor. They always ended up walking out of the room feeling ashamed, destroyed, and everyone in that lecture that heard this smackdown, their faith got compromised. Guys, if you wanna challenge something, then spend about 20 years studying about this and then go do a challenge. As simple as that. You need to devote and know every intricate detail of these theories and how they work and all this stuff in order to be able to challenge somebody who has dedicated their life to these kinds of studies. Um, don't go in and destroy your faith and the faith of countless others. The Bible doesn't say that we have to believe what we're learning. Uh, when you, you know, if you have to take your test on evolution, take the test. It doesn't mean you have to believe what you're studying. It just means you have to give the right answer. Correct? So don't challenge your teachers. This is not an area you will win unless you devote your life to deep study of this kind of, uh, these kind of theories. Um, because believe me, again, I've seen it dozens of times and it never turns out good. It's always bad. So uh, don't challenge your teachers on this, but if you want some resources, hit the next slide, Stephanie. Um, if you want some resources, here are two websites, um, and then there are uh, the YouTube videos, uh, one of them I showed, um, that were actually put together by intelligent designers. Um, they're kind of hard to sit through. Uh, don't think that you're gonna sit through all 12 chapters in two days. Because uh, some of the guys are kind of hard to listen to, <laughs> no lie. Uh, some of you are thinking the same thing about me right now, and I'm okay with that. Um, but these are some great ones. Actually, uh, Design Inference uh, is William Dembski's um, uh, and his group of uh, intelligent design scientists. Uh, it's their group, and they do some great, amazing work. And they actually have a video on their homepage right now of the complexity of the single cell, one of the Harvard ones uh, that were published. They've got articles. They've got all sorts of really neat stuff to read. Uh, but I will warn you, it's got a lot of scientific jargon in it. So as you read it, uh, have your dictionary.com open at the same time because you might need that just to understand what they're saying. Um, the second one is BioLogos. Uh, BioLogos has a website, but they're also on Facebook, and they put up web uh, articles ever so often on Facebook that are really uh, informative and give some really good arguments and, and keep you up to date on what the current studies in uh, intelligent design are showing and, and saying. So that's a really good one, especially if you're on Facebook. And then, of course, Unlocking the Mystery of Life and Unlocking the Mystery of Life version 2.0. Uh, those are on YouTube. Uh, all, all the chapters for both of them are on there. Um, you can read the, or watch those. Uh, they do a great job of explaining uh, a wide range of theories uh, concerning intelligent design and how it works and the mechanics and all that stuff and why origin, uh, you know, uh, why evolution to the origin of the species uh, is, is problematic. Uh, what the what the holes in the theory are. So um, let me clarify two things and then I'll take some questions. Um, when you go on and read stuff by these guys, um, when I say the word theory, almost. All of you in this room think that a theory is something that uh, has not been proven. But in the scientific world, when a scientist, an actual scientist, uses the word theory, he's using it in a definition that means um, something that started out as a hypothesis and has been thoroughly tested over time. Nothing in science is an actual law, but a theory is the closest thing to a scientific law that we have. Um, 
uh, our textbooks in high school and college use the word law a lot, but scientists don't actually use that word that often. Uh, theory is what, even gravity. You know, we've all, we were taught in, in school the law of gravity, right? And they use the word law. Most scientists don't even use the word law when it comes to gravity because the reason they say theory is because there's always new information coming. In other words, if it's a law, it's set in stone. It cannot change. But a theory has been tested, and it's pretty well proven, but it might change slightly over time given new evidence. So when you read these guys and they say theory, when they say theory, that means it's pretty well proven. If they use the word hypothesis, that's what we think of as theory. That's an uh, a idea or an experiment that's taking place that hasn't been really proven and set in stone yet. Um, so you know, that'll help you understand uh, their perspective and what they're saying. So let me do this. Let me open it up to some questions. It's right now 10.40, uh, so we've got about 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. But could he have left some, some of it out of the Bible because we couldn't understand it? Oh, yeah. Such as, <clears throat> if Adam and Eve were to walk in here right now, would we recognize him? We'd probably recognize him as a human, but could he be what we consider, the, what's it called, Prohagman or whatever, mm-hmm. the caveman? Right. Because mm-hmm. God did make the, those cells. That that's all part of his plan. Even though he, he tells us he made uh, Adam and Eve. Yeah. There are a lot of theories concerning the first man, uh, considering Adam and uh, Eve. Um, it depends on your, the theory that you hold to. You could be a theistic old earth a believer, which means that um, we believe what the Word of God says, but rather than taking a literal, it was 4,000 years, um, or it was 6,000 years, or 10,000 years, uh, we believe that the earth is billions of years old, um, and that there are either gaps in the biblical narrative, or the seven days were not literally 24-hour periods, or whatever. Um, so you could be a, the- a theistic old earthist, or you could be a a theistic new earth, which most of them believe that the earth is somewhere less than 10,000 years old. Creation took place sometime in the last 10,000 years. Um, And that according to uh, what we know about science and stuff, God created Adam and Eve and the earth and everything on the earth in a mature uh, state. In other words, he created a full-grown tree with the rings and everything that showed it was years and years old, even though it was one day old. Or he created Adam and Eve uh, as full-grown adults with all of the uh, layers and attributes and, and uh, shortfalls of a grown adult. Or, uh, and the earth was created with all the sediment layers that we now know. Uh, they're just, they're about two dozen different theories on how that could have taken place. The flood story plays a big part in, in these theories. Um, I personally, it also depends on what you believe the image of God means. Um, you can believe that image of God is our physical appearance. Uh, you can believe image of God is um, our mental capability. You can believe image of God is uh, our emotional and compassion uh, capabilities, uh, or you can believe that it is uh, the fact that we are the only eternal beings on the face of the earth, uh, that God is uh, immortal, uh, spiritual, and that we are immortal, spiritual beings as well. Um, I kind of hold to all of those. I think that image of God is actually a blending of all of those. I think the biggest part is that we are made spiritual beings. I think image of God, God doesn't have a body. God is not a human. Look up John 8, John 4. Um, you know, God does not have a physical body. God is a spirit, which means if we were made in his image, it means we have a spiritual side to us. But I think there's also, a, a, at least to some extent, a physical side, um, an emotional side, a compassionate side. There's no other uh, living thing on the face of the earth that shows the level of intelligence and emotion that we do. Now, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, dogs, birds, you know, the, every uh, most higher order thinking animals um, have some level of compassion and 
um, you know, emotion and things like that, but not to the level that we uh, possess, especially intelligence. Uh, we are the only creature who has been able to formulate, create, invent tools at the level that we do. I mean, the highest order of tool use in the animal kingdom is a chimpanzee who takes a rock and uh, lightly taps a nut to break it open. That is the highest order of tool use. Or uh, chimpanzees also use sticks. They'll stick them in a, a, a ant hole and they'll come out, pull it out covered in ants and they'll use it as a fork or a knife. But that's the highest order. It just pulls a plant off. It doesn't make one or make it more complex. It's, very, it's a very simple process for that chimpanzee. So I think image of God encompasses a little of all of those, but especially the spiritual side. If you hold that image of God is a little bit physical, that we have some kind of physical attribute of God, that God had an image of what he physically looks like, um, then I do believe that um, Adam and Eve were created in some form that looks very close to what we look like today. Now, if you were to do uh, cultural studies of uh, physical attributes of people who lived in Russia, live in Russia, uh, you know, Far Eastern Europe, and those who live in Great Britain, and those who live in the Netherlands, and those who live in Africa and the Orient, um, and those who live in America, even um, you can find that there are great differences and very specific differences uh, in each culture. I mean, you can very easily Google uh, facial features of uh, worldwide cultures, and there are studies where they've got generalized facial features of all the different culture, great cultures uh, across the world today, and we all have different facial features. Americans look different than Eastern Europeans, and we look different than uh, those who are in the Orient or in Africa. The facial features are distinctive per culture because of natural selection and things like that. Natural selection in humans is more intentional. You know, I, I look at my wife and I go, that woman is beautiful. I want to reproduce with her because that's natural selection in the human level. Um, and so for us in Eastern Europe, there's an, a look that is attractive and that look has been promulgated and has become the prominent features within that society. So yeah, there's minor changes, but I think overall we are, um, to some extent, we have this look and I think Adam and Eve had this look. They were probably much smaller. We do know that mankind has grown uh, over the centuries, we've actually, um, I, don't know, I don't know if Mike can speak to it or not, but there's been some studies done over the last couple hundred years of average adult height, and the adult height has increased in 150 years, if I'm remembering correctly, by two and a half inches. Just, just in the last 150 years, two and a half inches. I mean, so they were, must have been much smaller than we are. And there's a lot of attribute, things that go into that. There's hormones that we give to our, our, our food and uh, the way we've grown the quality of food and the things like that that have attributed to our growth. Uh, but that could have played a role back then as well. So yeah, it just depends on uh, where you fall on image of God and what your theory of the earth and and all of those things are. But I do believe that to some extent, Adam and Eve look like us, just maybe shorter. And I mean, let's face it, we as Americans are beautiful people. So maybe they were a little uglier too. I don't know. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. And Dennis, you're a beautiful man, by the way. Very handsome. <laughs> sorry, Shirley. Sorry. Dennis won't get his head out the door. <laughs> what other questions can I help answer or try to help answer? Um, you were Yeah, most historians believe that it's not quite as exaggerated as a lot of our Christian historians would have us believe. It, on his deathbed, he did say something along the lines of at least that God is a possibility for the origin of the universe. But most people believe, most historians believe that Darwin, even on his deathbed, recognized that his theory was the future of biological science in the world today. Um, as far as it being taught in our schools, um, Again, 
evolution exists. That side of it needs to be taught. It's part of God's creation. God created us to change. He, he designed our bodies to adapt. Uh, you look at, it's actually very interesting. You know, you see a wild boar. Uh, we have wild boars out here, um, out in the, the brushes out here in Havasu. Um, if you take a domesticated pig, you've seen a domesticated pig. It's not very hairy. It's light-skinned. Its teeth are, uh, you know, almost like ours. They're, they're designed to crunch food, and, and that's about it. Um, you let a domesticated pig go out into the wild within a year, within a 12-month time, that pig will completely change in appearance and behavior. Um, within 12 months, it'll grow tusks, its hair will thicken, it will adapt almost immediately to the environment that it's thrown into. Um, there's actually a lot of evolutionary study being done on pigs right now because they are one of the few creatures on the face of the earth that can spontaneously adapt to their environment in a very short time when we're talking physical changes taking place. Um, and we don't know why that happens. We don't know how it happens. But we do know that it's part of the way that God made them to change. Uh, and so the fact that evolution is being taught in school, I think, is a good thing. Evolution to the origin of species, on the other hand, um, that's why we have things like this. The, if you follow, if you're not a believer in some kind of higher power, uh, whatever your faith system is, if you don't believe that there's some kind of God or greater being out there, then evolutionary theory makes a lot of sense. It does. You know, you have to look at it from uh, the shoes of someone who does not believe in a God. Uh, from their perspective, it explains a whole lot about um, how we came about and where we come from and to make their disbelief in God more, uh, more easier to, to believe and, you know, go to sleep with every night. So, you know, we as Christians need to know the truth um, and when we can, you know, uh, share that truth with friends and stuff like that on a, on a personal relational basis. Uh, but, you know, we can't do anything about the schools teaching evolution uh, to the origin of species in classes other than do things like this, spread the truth and share things like these YouTube videos that make it very clear uh, that there's an intelligence that designed this world. And we believe that intelligence is uh, God Almighty, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, not really. There are a lot of scientists that um, have a belief in God, uh, but they may have a different belief of their uh, understanding of the literal Bible, for example. You know, if, if I was an evolutionary scientist and I believed that Genesis 1, 2, and 3 were uh, an allegory poem rather than a literal historical account, it'd very, be very easily for me to justify my faith with my evolutionary beliefs. So there are believers out there that uh, are scientists that study evolution. They just take a different spin on God's word. And, and to be honest with you, it's not difficult to believe that Genesis 1 through 3 could be a poem. Um, my understanding uh, through reading it in, a, in the original Hebrew, I don't believe it is a poem. Uh, it's not structured like all the other poems that are in uh, God's Word and Psalms and uh, Ecclesiastes and, and different books that have Hebrew poetry in them, um, and even the songs that are listed in Genesis and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So, you know, the, the idea that it's a poem or an allegory or something like that, um, I don't think that holds water, but a scientist studying evolution could believe that, and that way they could be a believer and believe in evolution at the same time. So, and they could believe that, you know, God created the universe through the Big Bang and through evolution and not have a problem with that because they believe Genesis 1 through 3 is uh, something other than a literal historical account. So there are believers out there, but they just don't apply that belief in a literal sense to the science. What else? Okay, I think, I think you're next, and then I'll come back over here. Larry? Yeah, 
Yeah, and since I've got 10 minutes, I'll, I'll do this. One of the reigning theories about the age of the earth and how we came about is called gap theory, G-A-P. That they believe, there's a lot of uh, biblical scholars that believe that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, into Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, so the first two verses of the book of Genesis, first two verses of God's word, there's actually a huge time gap between those two verses, billions of years between those two verses, um, because it actually, this theory holds a little water. It's actually a decent theory, uh, because it explains why it says that the earth was formless and void and, and chaos ruled over the waters. Um, and then in verse two, it starts talking about how God created the universe out of nothing. It could very easily explain why there's that slight discrepancy there. Um, there's a lot of theorists out there that believe that's the way it could be. And that a lot of people who believe that the earth is billions of years old believe in gap theory, that, that there's this huge uh, time gap between verses one and two in Genesis chapter one. So it does, it leaves us open for a lot of possibilities. The other one is the literal day theory. Um, if you hold to a literal day theory, that means you believe in Genesis chapter one that the uh, seven days of creation were literal 24 hour periods. Um, but a lot of people look at the word yom, which is the word in Hebrew for day. Yom has like seven different possible meanings. Uh, it can mean day, it can mean era, it can mean period of time. And so a lot of people believe gap theory and uh, non-literal day theory, which states that the days were hundreds, millions of years, possibly, for each day of creation, uh, and that God did it that way. Um, I think there's warrant in all those theories. Um, I don't hold strongly to either one, particularly, but um, they, they can be explained biblically. Again, this is one of those issues, guys, that there's enough in the Bible to support all these different theories, and so they're not divisive issues. They're not, you know, if Dennis is a literal one-day theorist and Larry, you're a, a Yom could be an era of time theorist, doesn't mean you can't fellowship and be believers in the same church and get along and do ministry together. It just means that you hold different theories on how that passage plays out. We don't actually know. It's, it's hard to say whether gap theory is the reigning theory or whether you know, that's the way God did it or if yom is a day or a million years. We don't know. It's just we don't have enough information in God's word to give us a yes, definitive, black and white, this is the answer. So yeah, you're right. That verse one opens up a possibility uh, for a lot of things time-wise. Mm -hmm. He set out as a scientist to prove that there was no God. Mm -hmm. And in the end, through mathematics and science, just like some of the stuff you brought up today, mm -hmm. he proved that science and God and the Bible are all scientific. It is really Will you write that down for me so I can check it out? Because again, and let me, uh, I, I'm, I have no idea whether he's a reputable scientist or not. I, I don't know his background. But there are, guys, there are a lot of books out there and there's a lot of websites that are uh, guys claiming to be scientific Christians and the stuff they're putting out is total hogwash. Uh, so do be cautious what you read and, and listen to and think about. I mean, the stuff I've given you, you could go, Psh, what a weirdo. Um, but... Um, you know, it, it's uh, be cautious what you listen to and, and read and believe because uh, there's a most of the stuff that's out there is not accurate. It's just way off base, uh, based off tradition rather than actual scientific study and the study of God's word. Uh, so, but I'll check that one out. That sounds interesting. Yes. Uh, if right yeah i it, it would be you need to define evolution itself the word evolution very specifically and if you define evolution the way i did that it's a 
progression of changes over generations that take place through genetic mutation and natural selection and, and genetic drift, then um, evolution is a theory, um, but evolution to the origin of species is a hypothesis, um, is what I, how I would answer that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, a wolf and a chihuahua technically could interbreed and produce viable, fertile offspring. Um, that'd be really weird, though. <laughs> but that being said, that's the definition of a species, is two individuals that could interbreed and produce um, viable, fertile offspring. So let me give you an example uh, I don't know if any of you are fa uh, ranchers out there, but what's a mule? Do you know what a mule is? It is when a horse and a donkey interbreed. It's actually very specific. I, if I'm remembering correctly, it's a male horse and a female donkey, or is it reversed? I can't remember. Anyways, when a, a horse and a donkey reproduce, they can produce a mule. And a mule is a viable um, individual, but it's not fertile. It cannot reproduce because donkeys and horses are not in the exact same species. They're not, the, they're not in the same species or subspecies group. They're in the same genus, which means um, they're close enough genetically that they could reproduce. A horse, has, a horse has 24 chromosomes and a donkey has 22, if I'm remembering correctly. It's something like that. So a mule ends up with 23, which is why it's infertile. That's why uh, those two are not considered the same, in the same species group is because while they can interbreed, they cannot produce a fertile offspring. Um, and so, you know, going back to evolution, uh, the creation of species and those kinds of things, if you're talking about uh, the fossil record, Piltdown Man, things like that, um, all of those are you know, they find a skeleton or a partial skeleton and they look at it and go, you know, this just doesn't look quite like a human does, so let's explain this away. And guys, it's, it's, way more, it's way more scientific and complicated than a lot of people realize. I mean, they even look at the internal structure of the cranium because our brain literally fills every crevice of the inside of our skull. There, if you were to, this sounds horrible, if you were to crack open your skull, there are little indentations all throughout the inside of your skull, and those indentations actually uh, demonstrate different developmental stages of your brain. There are parts of your brain that fit in those little grooves and those little indentations, and each of those in the little indentations you can attribute to a certain aspect of humanity, of our ability, of our thinking processes. Um, but the problem is, is so much of it is theoretical and so much of it is based on very partial skeletons. Piltdown Man is a great example. Piltdown Man, discovered in the late 1800s, uh, it was a jawbone and a tooth, and they took that jawbone and tooth and developed an entire evolutionary line of the progression of man's evolution and called it Pilt Piltdown Man. Uh, back in the 1930s, it was discovered that Piltdown Man's bones was a huge hoax. Uh, the jawbone was out of, uh, was a reshaped from uh, a if I'm remembering correctly, it was a orangutan jawbone and it was a pig tooth. Um, and a guy took and intricately fit them together and said that he found them in a dig and all this stuff. And science totally believed it. And a lot of the progressions of man's evolution are discoveries like that. A lot of the full skeletons are easily explained by genetic abnormalities or things like that, or it could just be some crazy spiritual thing to throw us off, we have no idea. Um, actually, if you study human genome and you know progression of human evolution, even a lot of the stuff you read in your textbooks or read in your textbooks in school about, you know, man started this and then it progressed up to what we are now today, um, they believe that most of those didn't even, aren't even on our branch. Uh, uh, I can't remember... Um, one of the paleo Paleolithic um, uh, cavemen, I can't remember the name, my, my mind just went blank. Um, they actually believe that that's a branch that died off of the human, uh, if you believe that evolution is a tree 
uh, that branches off in all these areas, they believe that this one who, that's portrayed in our textbooks as being part of our lineage, they actually believe very strongly now that it's a completely separate branch that died off and has nothing to do with us as humans. We may have a common ancestor, but uh, it, they did not lead to what we are today. Um, so what you've seen in your textbooks is grossly um, simple down and uh, you know, uh, inaccurate. As a matter of fact, there's a lot. Uh, how many of you in middle school read about the sections of the tongue and the taste buds? Have you ever seen that? There's sections of your tongue that taste different things. That theory has been a total hogwash since the 1930s. The human tongue is completely spread in the way it tastes. There's not regions or sections. It, it, nobody's believed that since the 30s and 40s, but it's still printed in our textbooks today uh, because it's so commonly believed. So there's a lot of stuff like that that we look at and we go, eh, uh, we need to educate our people a little better. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, my notes, if you were to look up here, these are very simplified, just bullet points, because um, I've taught this lecture several times. Um, I'll tell you what, I will put links up for stuff in my blog, and I'll share them on the Facebook page and on the website, but it'll take me probably a couple of weeks to type everything out and get it all put together. So, but I'll do that as my next project, because I need another project. <laughs> Chris. Mm-hmm. How do we go about as a community, as a, a communion of people, of actually getting along in, with our different beliefs about these things? Because as far as a community or as far as a church or both? As a church, uh, as Christians in general, okay. around the world, too, especially what's going to be happening in the next couple decades, you, everyone's aware of we have people in space right now, they're, they're basically lab rats mm-hmm. every year. Yeah. And they're going to be going to Mars in the next 20, 30 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How do we begin to come together so that we don't tear ourselves apart in the next 30 years? Um, that's a difficult one because let me tell you why. There are some people, and I, some people maybe even in this room, who uh, are so set on what they've been taught traditionally uh, that they're not willing to waver. Um, and so there are those people that you're never going to get along with. No matter what you do, what you say, what proof you provide, you're just not going to get along with with them because they don't want to hear the argument. They, they're, this is what I believe and you're not gonna convince me otherwise. And um, you know, and I, we shouldn't judge them. I mean, that they were taught something and they've built a, a system of faith around that belief system. Um, and so to completely whip around and change that faith system because of new information is difficult for any human to do. Belief systems, guys, for us, as humans, belief systems are one of the things that make us human, humans you know, very unique uh, from all the other creation in the world. We are the one and only set of creatures that have a very intricate belief system that develops uh, over time. Um, the closest thing we've found to it is um, gorillas are believed to have a belief system about their environment. Um, we've actually witnessed in the wild where gorillas will uh, when they're moving locations, uh, they will avoid certain areas of their quote-unquote territory. And some scientists believe that it's either because of something that happened in the past that created a cultural belief system amongst the gorillas that they avoid that area, whether it's got a spiritual tie or what, nobody knows. But um, to change that belief system in that gorilla would be monumental task. It'd be very difficult for us to get along, we need to, I think Calvary has, has it nailed on the head. We need to understand what are the essential doctrines. What are, what are those beliefs that we will not absolutely budge on? They're not up for debate. They're not, not, they're not negotiable. We will believe these no matter what is out there because this is God's word. And we've got five of them here at Calvary. We need to understand what each of ours as individuals, what our non-negotiable essential doctrines are, and then understand that every other doctrine outside of those essentials are up for debate, and we don't lose fellowship with someone just because they believe something different. Uh, we, we don't 
not do ministry or not cooperate or uh, be friends with them because they believe something else than, that we do about the end times or about evolution or about Calvinism and Arminianism. I mean, there are so many different uh, theories and beliefs that are tied into God's word that are not 100% black and white that are up for debate. And we can all agree to disagree in those areas, but there are those few essentials that we go, you know what, these are, these are not up for debate. These are not negotiable, and we will not budge on them. And I think, that's, I think that's the best way to cooperate, is understand what your essentials are. And as long as you know, person B from such and such church is, lines up with those essential doctrines also, then you know, we can minister and we can fellowship. You know, it doesn't mean we can't be friends if they don't agree with our essentials, but it does mean that uh, there's gonna be a difference in how we approach ministry in God. So, but that's hard because a lot of people don't believe that, what I just said. <laughs> don't agree with me at all. So, what else? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and let me say this. Um, what she's talking about is could evolution through a long period of time lead to an individual or a group of individuals that were genetically unique enough that they technically qualified as a new species? Does that make sense? In other words, um, let's take one of the most well-known evolutionary creatures that are out there, the finch. There's millions of types of finches in the world today. Um, it's one of the animals that Darwin studied on the Galapagos Islands because every finch on each of the Galapagos Islands has a different shaped beak because the food on each of the Galapagos Islands is completely different, the, the type of food available. And so each finch has over a period of time, because the Galapagos Islands have actually gone up and gone down. Uh, islands have disappeared in the Galapagos chain, and islands have appeared out of nowhere in the Galapagos chain, and iguanas and finches have migrated over and have adapted to the conditions of that new, unique island. It doesn't mean they've created a new species, but let me ask you this. Is the definition of a species, the way we categorize what a species is, is that a biblical definition or is that something that God created? Or, yeah, is that something that is a biblical or is it something that man created? Sorry. It's something that we created. It's a way that we classify animals in other order to understand them, but it's not in any way, shape, or form based off of God's word. Does God's word say that through the way he made creation, through and its ability to change, that it's not possible for a new, unique species to come about. No, God's word does not say that. Now, when it comes to humans, it says that because we, as humans, are unique individuals made in the image of God. We are the only species on the face of the earth that can make that claim. So for us to say that we could have a new species of humans, that's off the table. But... Um, to have a new species of finch or a new species of single-celled organism, that's a possibility because it's not a biblical definition. It's a man-made definition that is created for us to help understand um, you know, what, uh, how to understand the, the living world. If you go and look at the biblical definitions, it categorizes them into fish, plants, those that crawled on the earth, and those who roamed on the earth, and those that flew in the sky. I mean, those are the general you know, classifications of animals, and it doesn't get more specific than that. So um, even if a new species arose, it's, uh, it wouldn't waver our belief in God's word any, uh, it, it, because God's word doesn't say that that can't happen except with humans. Um, we are unique in that way. So any other questions? It's 11, 10 after 11. If you need to go, go ahead and go. I'm, I'll stick around for another while and answer any of your questions that you might have, but if you need to go.